What makes somebody bid in an auction? What makes them bid a lot in an auction? What makes them not bid at all in an auction and other factors that determine whether you're going to have a successful auction or not? Today on Behind the Gavel with Jason, we'll be talking about bidder and auction psychology and what this means for you as a bidder, buyer, or seller at an auction and why we do some of the things that we do the way that we do them at our auction house. My name is Jason Roski. I'm the owner of the auctioneer. I'm the owner at the KC Auction Company here in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you all for watching. And we get this, we get asked this question regularly, especially by potential sellers, uh, about obviously they're wanting to know who's going to be bidding, why would they bid, how much is it going to get bid for? Should they set a high opening bid or minimum reserve price on it? And, and other factors that determine whether someone feels comfortable with the auction process as a seller. Uh, these also apply to a bidder as well. Uh, if you're thinking of bidding on an auction, some of the things that you might feel and experience as a bidder, we'll talk about those things as well. So auction psychology, auction fever is a term that a lot of us have heard or used in over the years. But what causes it and why is it important for an auctioneer to understand this and also for you as a seller or buyer to understand it? So auction fever is generally thought of as the idea that once you start to bid on something, you will bid more on it than if you hadn't bid at all. Um, and we see this regularly and over again when people bid on something, they start to take possession of it. They start to take ownership of it. Psychologically, that's called the endowment effect, uh, where we overvalue what we already own. And once you start bidding on something, you start to take ownership of that object. And it's hard to describe to somebody who's not bid in an auction, but we see it regularly. And, and, and we also note that if you don't get that first bid from a potential buyer, you're not going to get the second bid or the third or the 15th bid. And so getting buyers engaged in an auction, whether it's a $2 bid or a $200 bid, is crucial to them being competitive in it going forward. We're often asked about putting minimum bids or reserve prices or, or a higher opening bid on an object when we always I mean, I would say 99.9% .9 of the items we've sold in the last 15 years, we have offered with no reserve pricing. Are there bargains out there because of that? Yeah, it does happen. Uh, but I will tell you, a good friend of mine who's been coming to my auctions as a buyer and a seller once told me, he said, Jason, you know, if, we, if, you, if everybody paid retail for everything that you sell, nobody would come to your auctions. And I had to uh, agree with him completely on that. So the, the practice of setting a high minimum bid or a reserve price is called anchoring. And as a seller, it makes a lot of sense. And if you're watching this, have questions or comments, go ahead and post them here, send us a direct message. I'll also give you more contact information at the end of the video. But the, the, it's called anchoring. And as a seller, it makes sense because you wanna make sure you have that protection, that anchor of a price. You think something's worth $500, you wanna sell it for less than $500, so you wanna put a $500 opening bid price on it uh, or a reserve. And what ends up happening is that buyers will just look past the item with a high opening bid, or if they realize there's a reserve in play, they'll look for the next item to buy. There is a lot of merchandise for sale at any given time in history, but especially now, baby boomers are still downsizing at an extremely high rate. Uh, the economy is doing great, so prices are high. Houses are selling, so people are, are buying and selling and looking for new things. But there's still, when you look at the demographic uh, breakdown of our society, there's still more baby boomers than anybody else. And they're at that point in life where they're divesting and selling. And so there's a lot of opportunity from a buyer standpoint. Oh, my nose is itching. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities from a buyer standpoint to be patient and find someone who's really in the market to sell. And oftentimes that buyer will pay more from somebody who's ready to sell than from somebody who is just shopping for a price. And so we, we often see that uh, if you have similar items offered by similar auction companies, one with a reserve and one without, the company that offers it without a reserve will, will achieve a higher sell-through rate and a higher sell price. Catawiki, which is an online auction provider, has studied this, and they're, they're dealing with hundreds of thousands of data points, about millions of data points. And they found that similar items offered with and without reserve have very different endings. The items without a reserve and without a high anchor price sold for 29% more than similar items offered 
with the reserve or with the high price. Thanks for watching, Nancy and Dakota. If you guys have any questions or thoughts about what we're talking about, please go ahead and post them or let me know. So 29% difference, an item offered without a reserve as compared to with a reserve. That's a lot of money. You know, let's go from $1,000 to $1,300. That, that pays the commission on a lot of things that you're going to sell through a professional auctioneer. Um, and so take their, take our experience to heart, take our thoughts to heart. Um, there is somewhat of a risk when you sell items without reserve, but historically the National Auctioneers Association has done studies on this. We've studied it personally in either of the three auctions we've done, although we, I, I can't say we sell much with a reserve price anymore. Um, and, and again, with Kennewicki saying that they see a 29% difference in price to realize without reserve and with, when we tell you to sell something without a reserve, we have a real strong reason for it. It's not that we're wanting to sell it for anything, because obviously we get paid on a commission basis. But we want to get it the most money for everybody involved. Good morning, Mercedes. How are you doing today? Thanks for watching. We're talking about auction psychology and, and what compels somebody to bid and buy at an auction or not. Uh, so the not side, you know, if you're scrolling as a buyer and you see something that you like that you think might be worth $500 and somebody's got an opening bid of $300, well, that's a reasonable deal, but it's not exciting. It's not enticing. It's not, you know, it's not a steal of a deal. And auctions are there to <laughs> for the possibility of a steal. Well, Mercedes, I'm sorry about that, but that kind of proves my point exactly, you know, that you never win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And so, yeah, you know, it's it is uh, when you have competitive bidding in an auction, you, some people do lose, and that's that is definitely a side effect of it uh, when we do things right here at the auction house. Of course, the auction company use plays a huge role in that. Do they know what they're selling? Can they market it well? Can they get the right buyers interested? But all those factors aside, my goodness, my allergies must be acting up. All of those things, if they're on a level playing field aside, uh, just that number from Catawiki, 29%, that's a huge number. That is a huge number when you look at, you know, the quantity of volume of items being sold on a daily basis. Thanks for watching, Tracy. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, hit the like button if you think what I'm sharing is interesting. Uh, and Tracy, you know, she's a local uh, jewelry appraiser here in town. We've worked with her many, many times, and she can attest to the fact that items off without reserve in, in jewelry auctions, the better pieces almost always bring higher value than you would get from a standalone offer or from asking a static price. Um, again, you know, there's always the things that sell for less than what you hope they would, but oftentimes there's a reason for that. And a good auctioneer, a good auction company, a state sale company is going to talk to you about why those things happen. We're, we're working with an estate right now, small partial estate that has some nice set sumo pottery. They have a piece that's about 32 inches tall. It's a huge floor base, but it has some condition issues. And so we've been very diligent about explaining to them, yes, it's a great piece. It could have brought thousands of dollars if it was in perfect condition, but now it's much more decorative than collected. And so the value is going to drop tr you know, tremendously down to a couple hundred dollars, probably on a piece that at one point they were told was worth you know, over $15,000. What turns me off is when they extend the time on an online auction. That's a great point. Uh, that's the same thing happens at a live auction, though, Tina. When somebody bids against you in a live auction, they don't take your bid and stop. They take your bid and look to the other person to bid again. And that is why we use a soft, we call it the soft close technology here at the KC Auction Company. Um, you know, we are in the job, our job as auctioneers, as professional auctioneers, is to garner the most bids the most activity and the highest prices for our sellers. And we have found that the soft close technology does that the best of any online bidding uh, software uh, feature. Uh, you know, we, I, I was an original eBay power seller. I've been selling online antiques and collectibles online for 15 years, 20 years, something like that. And one of the, the most interesting things about eBay is you can see an item go from uh, you know, hundred dollars to a thousand dollars in less than two seconds, uh, because everybody's sniping at the last second. But oftentimes, somebody would say, "Oh, I'd have bid two thousand dollars if I had a chance to bid again." Well, that's great for the person who got it for the thousand dollars, but it's terrible for the person selling it. And in our role as an auction company, our job is to get the most value, the most return for our clients. And that soft close technology, although it can be a bit frustrating as a bidder. 
Um, it's also the most fair and honest and, and transparent way that we know of to, to, to get the highest value for the objects as they're selling. You don't lose to a faster computer. You, you might lose to somebody who's willing to pay more, but not to a faster computer. And, and so that's why we've used that uh, platform, that style personally, and thousands of auction companies around the country and world use that similar technology now. Um, and again, like I said, at a live auction, they're not taking a bid and stopping, they're taking a bid and looking for other people to bid against you. So it's, it replicates very closely that live auction mentality. Black clay from Waxco, worth anything else some pieces are about 20 years old. Uh, it really depends on what the pieces are specifically, Mercedes. You could you know, send us an email, uh, drop us a message with pictures, and I'd give you an idea. Some of the uh, Aloxica uh, clay pieces are worth quite a bit. Uh, just depends on if they were, you know, the tourist grade pieces generally aren't. There's some collector value to them, but there's always better, you know, there's good, better, and best in every collecting asset and category. And it, it holds true in Mexican pottery, Mexican jewelry, and silver, or French antiques. And there's good, and better, and best. Uh, so what would keep somebody from bidding? We've talked about, uh, you know, the, the high bid, high opening bid or high reserve prices, having people move on. Uh, poor quality of photography, poor quality of, uh, of descriptions is another reason that somebody would not bid in an online auction. You know, if you don't feel comfortable as a bidder, you're not going to bid on an item uh, if you're not sure what it is. Because the last thing anybody wants to do is bid on a, va on a piece of pottery or glass and get it and find out it's damaged. Uh, or has been repaired. And so knowing who your seller is, again, we talk about that almost every, every every week on Behind the Gavel here. Knowing who you're buying from is such an important aspect of, to, to uh, feeling comfortable as a buyer. You know, and so some of the other things that would drive auction fever, as what's been called, is where did the items come from? Who collected them? Where did they collect them from? Uh, are these things that a dealer's trying to, you know, to, to slide off. They've had an inventory for a long time. Are these things right from an estate? We generally find that people are more passionate and more excited about items that have been collected over a long time or came from somebody's estate who is known in some capacity in some genre or some area of life. Uh, simply because it gives it a legacy, it gives it, a, it, gives it a, a, a history and something that makes the piece more scarce. Um, some of the, the clinical terms, you know, domino effect we talked about, um, anchoring, you know, and, and social proof is another big factor as to why people bid and bid aggressively in an auction. If somebody else shows interest in an object that you're bidding on, you feel vindicated and validated in your belief that the item is worth bidding on. And so uh, by getting competitive bidding going, you'll oftentimes, almost always see a higher price realized than if you put a single high price out there. Um, just because the, the social construct, that idea of all oh, your you know you are, your thoughts of value on something was vindicated by other people's ideas of value as well. So thanks all for watching. I'm going to wrap this up here. It's uh, finally summer has uh, made an appearance here in Kansas City. It's in the 90s this week here in Kansas City, which is it's finally made it to July. This is a, a really been a really mild, wet spring here in Kansas City, but summer is finally here. Um, we have some great, exciting things happening here at the KC Auction Company. An auction we're working on right now that has some of the best things we've ever had to sell. Uh, in a week and a half, I'm going down to New Orleans to present uh, at the National Auctioneers Association a presentation on Facebook and social media marketing, how we went from 10, 12,000 lot views to 125,000 lot views in five years, and what that, how other auctioneers can benefit from that information. Uh, pretty excited about that. And we do have some uh, movement on a new building. So that's exciting as well. Uh, as the company continues to grow, we're going to have an opportunity and a space to do that with. So more news on that as things get more in place. But thank you all so much for watching. If you have questions or comments, go ahead and post them here. We'd love to read those and answer them as we get them. If you have something you want to ask us personally or specifically, you can always send us a direct message through Facebook. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at kcauctioncompany.com. That's info at the letter K, letter C, auction company, spelled out, dot com. I see that, and Amy, my manager, sees that. You can also give us a phone call at 816-283-3633, 816-283-3633. We'll be happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Uh, it's been, again, we're extremely busy right now. Some great estates we're working on, but we'll get to you as soon as we can. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, and uh, have, a, have a great 4th of July. That's next Thursday. It's hard to believe we're already to July 4th in the, in the annual calendar. 
This year's flying by. So have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon.